Let's open our Bibles now to Revelation chapter 21. And we're uh, studying through the book of Revelation, and it's been a wonderful study. Uh, my heart has been truly blessed, and uh, I hope that each and every one of you who have been here and, and listened, that God has uh, at least allowed you to see some things and learn some things that will be a help to you. Um, we come to verse number uh, 17. He measured the wall thereof a hundred and forty and four cubits according to the measure of man and, as, and that is of the angel of a man that is of the angel. And as we mentioned before, this was the city was 1,500 miles square. It was a perfect cube, 1,500 miles uh, high, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long. It was in four dimensions. And uh, it uh, was all according to a perfect cube, as anything that God does is going to be perfect. And uh, if you count up the cubits and... Uh, everything together there it comes out to 1500 miles and the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was of gold now jasper is uh, uh, there are several different colors of jasper but it's uh, normally uh, can be from red to yellow uh, the city was of pure gold like unto clear glass the foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. Now jasper is an opaque color, uh, which is somewhat clear. The second was a sapphire, which is normally uh, the most beautiful, richest is blue. And uh, the third, uh, chalcedony, is a white to gray color. The fourth was an emerald, which is green. And the fifth was sardonyx, uh, which is a green-yellow color. And the sixth was sardis, which is red. The seventh was uh, chrysolite, uh, which is a green-yellowish color. And the eighth was beryl, which is green. The ninth, a topaz, which is... I uh, looked uh, at all kinds of different colors of topaz... So it's hard to really narrow it down uh, to just one color. Uh, and uh, the uh, tenth, a uh, chrysophrancius, however you pronounce that, chrysophrancius, and uh, that is a, a green or yellow. And then the eleventh was a jasoneth, which is orange-red color. And the twelfth, an amethyst which is uh, a purple color. And uh, these are all, all just beautiful stones. If you, if you have a, an iPhone and you look up these stones uh, and look at how beautiful they are, I mean, you can, you can see that the Lord was wanting us to understand that what He's doing is just the beauty is beyond compare. Uh, it's just splendid beyond imagination. And it says in verse number 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Uh, I was studying pearls, and they were talking about, a, I believe it was a 20-grain pearl uh, being a very large pearl. And you can imagine building a gate from a pearl. Uh, what kind of a pearl it is, we don't know. Every several gate was of one pearl. So the, the, the language seems to indicate that the pearl was big enough to make more than one gate. And the street of the city, notice this, pure gold, pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Now, you know, the gold that they find today in most places is mixed with different uh, elements and they have to burn it and purify it and even then it's still uh, you know got impurities but this gold is so pure 
that it's transparent. It, you can see through it. And I saw no temple therein. Now, that's a departure from what God has done while here on this earth. From, you know, early on, there was the tabernacle. And uh, after the tabernacle, there was the temple. And there were three temples. And then after the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., uh, there, uh, the Lord established His church in the first century. And His churches have been the way that He has done His work for the last 2,000 years. And we see here that there's no temple because He's going to explain, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The Lord Himself, the Lamb, which will be a representation of the Lamb that was slain, which will immediately remind us of the price that He paid because He was the Passover Lamb. He was the perfect sacrifice. You see, when the Passover time came, they would pick out a yearling. Uh, it was one year old, and it had to be without blemish. And so it would be the very best lamb they had. And they would keep it up and they would feed it and protect it and prepare that lamb to be the Passover lamb that would be slain. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ became the fulfillment of that. On the very day that the lamb would have been presented, Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And remember, John had said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. So now, when we get to this new Jerusalem, remember it's going to be here on this earth. Uh, people think that heaven's going to be way, way off somewhere off in the far yonder. No, where we're going to dwell for eternity is here on this earth. It's going to be a new heaven. It's going to be a new earth. All of the, the remnants of the old earth and heaven will be destroyed. And we're going to live here on this new earth. And new Jerusalem is going to come down from God out of heaven. And so there will be no temple. And the, the Lamb and the Lord will be the temple. And the city had no need of the sun. That will be strange. You know, we, uh, uh, we got, I got out a little while on Monday. Went to, a fellow called me and wanted me to go with him. And I went out with him and spent a little time. And uh, I didn't take any sunblock. And after about two or three hours, boy, I'm telling you, that sun starts hurting. And your arms start hurting and your, your ears and your neck. And uh, so... I, I got an old rag and put it around my head and got it wet, you know, because the sun was beating down on us. I'm so glad we had water. But there's going to be no sun there. You know why? Because it says, neither the moon no, to shine in it for the glory of God. The glory of God, that word glory is from the word doxa, which means the worth or value of God, the glory of God and His, His power and His greatness are going to be the light of it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. So there'll be no sun and moon. So uh, people say, well, the sun's not going to go away for so many hundreds of billions of years. Well, I've got news for them. The sun's going to go away a lot sooner than that. Because God's going to destroy it. And He's going to destroy the moon. There'll be no more moon. And uh, these things are all going to pass away. And the nations of them which are... And here's the critical word in verse 24. The nations of them which are saved. Amen. This word is the word we get soteriology from. Uh, which means deliverance. Deliverance. Uh, 
once we had an ordination and I asked a preacher, when did you get saved? And he said, which time are you talking about? He said, one time I was walking under a ladder and a board nearly hit me in the head. My dad saved me there. And I said, well, I, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I've got no more questions for you. And it uh, turned out he went hard in shell and, uh, because he didn't believe that you get saved. He believes that salvation just suddenly dawns on you. But the Bible says, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. So the nations of them which are saved, that word nations just simply means the divisions of them. Because remember, God saves people from every tribe and every nation under heaven. All kinds of people. It's not just going to be Baptist. It's not just going to be white people. It's not just going to be black people. It's going to be all kinds of people. But when we get there, we're all going to be the children of God. And I don't believe there'll be any color barriers or anything like that. It'll all be uh, whatever God decides. Perhaps it'll be like Jesus was when he was here on the earth and he was a Jew, uh, which meant he probably had dark skin and and maybe brown eyes, uh, whatever it may have been. But anyway, uh, this place is a wonderful place for the saved because the unsaved cannot go there. Now, I want to tell you this. If you're not saved, you're not going to go to this place. And you cannot be trusting in your works to get you to heaven. Your works will not get you to heaven. I was talking with a woman uh, earlier this week and I asked her I said are, are you going to heaven when you die and she said I've been baptized and I said baptism won't get you into heaven and uh, I quoted several scriptures in the Bible to her and I said have you ever trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior and repented and been saved and she never responded she just said, I've been baptized. That's good enough for me. So a lot of people think that all you got to do is get baptized. I was baptized four times. Three times I wasn't saved, so it was not scriptural. And the fourth time was after I truly got saved, and then I followed the Lord in scriptural baptism. Make sure that when you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you follow him in scriptural baptism. And so it says, The saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Now that doesn't uh, mean that uh, these kings are going to be any different. That word there for kings means that the people who, who served God and were of, of great stature... Because remember, it tells, we studied earlier on that the Bible says we've been made kings and priests unto our God. One translation says a kingdom of priests. So we're kings and priests unto our God. And we're going to be a part of that city. It says they're going to walk. Now, we know that we're going to have glorified bodies. And I believe from what we read in the Bible that we're not going to be hindered by our, we're not going to have flesh. We're going to have glorified bodies. So we can travel at the speed of thought. Not the speed of light, but the speed of thought. Now whatever bidding the Lord will have us do, or whatever we'll be involved in, and we don't know a lot about that because He's not really told us much about that, except that we're going to worship Him and live in this wonderful place. The Bible says, The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. There's another thing. There'll be no temple, there'll be no sun, there'll be no moon, there'll be no lost people, and there'll be no night. When I was a child, I was always afraid of the night. I slept with my dad up until I was about six years old because I was scared at night. 
my mom would leave a little light on in the house. And uh, if I woke up and it was dark, I, I would just get scared. You know, because I, I, I just, I don't know why I was just like that. But uh, I'd get real close to my dad and I'd feel so safe, you know, at night. And, uh, but there, there'll be no more night. And uh, you'll, you'll no longer be afraid because night is the absence of light. And there'll be no absence of light there. Because the light will shine and Christ will be that light. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations un into it. All of the honor and glory will be brought to the Lord. And those who have been saved from every tongue and tribe will come there and they will give honor to the Lord. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. That word defileth is a, a word that is in the New Testament related to that which is unclean, uh, that which is vile. Uh, it talks about in Romans uh, chapter 1 and 2 about uh, a people who became vile and they defiled themselves with sin and wickedness. Uh, we can defile ourselves, but as a child of God, uh, we're told that we're to walk in the light as He is in the light, that we might have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. But if we don't walk in that light, our lives can get pretty messy. And we need to, to live hour by hour in thankfulness for God's salvation. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. You know, there are certain sins that uh, uh, the Bible talks about being abominable sins. This is, uh, you know, I remember when I was a boy, uh, we'd watch uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and there'd be the abominable snowman. And he'd come out, you know, and trying to get everybody. And when I first heard that, that's what I thought about. Uh, but this word abomination carries the idea of, of doing something that brings society down. That brings people and culture down. And that's what happens when we forget God. Any nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. And we see in many nations, even now around the world, where they are communist countries, atheistic countries. I don't know if you heard this, but I read where that the, the uh, leader of China had said that all the Christians were to replace uh, their visions or pictures of Jesus with his picture because he was their uh, redeemer. And, uh, of course, we know that in communism, they, they hate God, just like Russia and China and Cuba and other communist countries. They uh, persecute God's people. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now you say, well, when was your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Well, it was written before the foundation of the world. See, God loved you before the world began and set His love upon you, and your name was recorded there. Now, you, when you got saved, you were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and it became official in time, according to Ephesians 2. It was after you believed that you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. God is sovereign, and He's not going to lose any. He's going to save every one of His elect. Now, we see from, from our text uh, that this city is holy. We've noticed before that it's the bride of the Lamb. The city is uh, uh, illuminated by the glory of God, and He is the light bearer of, of all things. Uh, there is no sanctuary in this city, for the Lamb 
and uh, the Almighty God are the ones we worship. New Jerusalem has a wall. The wall is very high. If you look at verse 12, it says, chapter 21, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Last week we talked about the twelve disciples, uh, and we talked about the twelve apostles, representing the Old Testament and the New Testament. And by the way, uh, verse 14 talks about the twelve apostles of the Lamb, now, Judas Iscariot is not one of them. Remember, he was lost and he fell because he was uh, uh, chosen as that vessel uh, and uh, he uh, committed suicide. And uh, we also see that the wall had 12 foundations, the city had 12 gates, and uh, the city had avenues made of the purest gold of transparent glass. The city had rivers of water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. Now I want, I want you to see this. Um, verse number one of chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. It was clear as crystal. I suppose the clearest water that I've ever seen is that uh, in Florida they have a place there where they have glass bottom boats and uh, you can ride these glass bottom boats and you can see down for like two or three hundred feet because the water is so clear and you can see fish and alligators and how many ever rode that? Nobody? Brother Bailey? Uh, when I was a young boy mom and dad took us when I was about ten or eleven and I wanted to get a fishing pole out so bad. <laughs> I couldn't hardly stand it. I saw those fish under that boat. But notice that this pure river, it's, it's pure, so pure that it's clear as crystal. And notice what happens. It proceeds out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So it comes out of the throne. The throne is there, the throne of God that's covered with the rainbow that has the cherubims and the seraphims that surround the throne, crying, holy, holy. And out of that throne proceeds this beautiful river, pure as crystal. We sing, Shall we gather at the river Where bright angels' feet had trod With its crystal tide forever flowing by, it's not by, is it? Flowing by the throne of God. Now, when I sing that, in my mind, I picture the throne and I picture the river running by it. But it don't run by it, does it? No, it proceeds out of it. So we need to change the words of that instead of flowing by the throne of God it needs to say flowing from the throne of God and it says in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the street of it and either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations now the Greek word here for the tree is the word for wood. The wood, which a tree is made of wood. It's the wood of life. Now there's another tree. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's where total depravity comes from. When we talk about the doctrines of grace. I hope all you children learn the doctrines of grace. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance and preservation of the saints. Those are the doctrines of grace. And they're true. They're Bible doctrines. Not because of Calvin, but because they're in the Bible. 
And here we see that this tree is wood, and the way that God brought redemption for us was our Savior went to the cross, which was made of wood. And remember, the Scripture said, Cursed is every man who hangeth on the tree. That, that word tree is for wood. So Christ was nailed to the cross. He had no sin. He did nothing wrong. He was lied on. He was falsely accused. They smote him. They spit upon him. They took a, a whip and beat his back. And then after the blood had soaked into the robe, they jerked it off. And then they, beat, they, they did all sorts of things. They smote him in the face. And there he hung on the cross. And the Lord Jesus Christ hung there dying for our sins on that wood. Blessed now is every man who has been saved by the work of that wood. Because Jesus Christ, not only did he die, but he was buried. And he rose from the grave. And that secured our redemption. That he died for us, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead. Listen, that's the gospel. That is the message of salvation. That will save your soul. So we've seen that this city has avenues of gold, rivers of water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Along the side of each avenue runs a river. The avenue and the river are separated only by what would uh, many believe would be this beautiful place, like a park, uh, but it will be more beautiful than any park we've ever known. This river is the river of life, for it symbolizes eternal life. You see, when you're saved, you don't have to wait to get eternal life. God gives it to you at the moment of your conversion. We are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Old things are passed away and all things become new. And right now, if you're saved, you have eternal life. It's yours forever. God gives it to you and nobody can take it from you. We also see that this river of life symbolizes God's salvation, full and free, the gift of God's wonderful, sovereign grace. And what is life but fellowship with God? The river proceeds from the throne, and out of it proceeds the blessings from the Father. What a wonderful place this will be. Amen. The Bible tells us, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit. So every month, which we're not going to be in time, because there's not going to be uh, seasons, uh, but every so often it says that this tree is going to bear fruit, and it's going to yield her fruit every month. This is anthropomorphic language so that we can understand. But remember, we're not going to be in time then. We're going to be in eternity. And notice it says, And the leaves of the tree. Now normally leaves are not usually that that good for stuff but sometimes they are and here the leaves are for the healing of the nations now however that works I don't understand all of it I don't pretend to I read five or six commentaries and I got more confused by reading them because there's no way really to explain this except that for whatever reason God is going to now allow us right to the tree of life where we will eat the fruit and even eat the leaves, even though we won't need to eat 
because we won't get hungry. Remember, a glorified body doesn't get hungry. And we don't have to have water, but we're going to have it. It's going to be the purest of all water. Uh, you know, when we were little, we used to have a well that had sulfur in it. And every time we'd pull up the water, we'd smell that sulfur and it'd get real red on the dipper. But that's all we had to drink, you know. So, uh, And I can remember the first time I went to someone's house and we drew water and there was no sulfur smell. And I thought, boy, this is the greatest water in the world. Because ours kind of smell like rotten eggs, you know. But, uh, and, and then I went home and I said, Mom, why does our well smell so bad? My, our, the boy I stayed all night with, their well didn't stink like ours. And Dad said, well, son, we've just got a well that's got sulfur in it. So we had to drink that until we finally got a, a different place to live where the water was better to drink. But this water's perfect. And the Bible says, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Now, that uh, could refer to angels, but it could refer to us too. So what will we do? We're going to worship. We're going to bow at His throne. We're going to, you know, I don't know. God, God is in charge of this. And there may be things that God has planned that He's never told us about that He's going to have us do in eternity. I know we won't be bored and I know we won't get lazy or, you know, just want to sit around. We'll be doing things exciting. We'll be doing things wonderful because the Lord will be our leader. And they shall see His face. Now, how God is going to present Himself to us. Uh, earlier, it talked about a lamb. But here it says we're going to see His face. How we're going to be able, because God is spirit. Remember, He's not flesh. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. But there's going to be something familiar about God that we're going to recognize as His children, and we're going to see Him face to face. That's one of the promises He makes. And the Bible says... His name shall be in their foreheads. Remember we talked about the mark of the beast. The number 666 being the number of man. And uh, all of those things relating to the Antichrist. And the uh, son of perdition. And those things we've already studied. But here we see that the children of God are going to have his name in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever. Does that say reign? I looked that up just to make sure I wasn't just reading that wrong. And that word reign is a word that's used for royalty. Uh, it's for a conqueror. We're going to reign you know, when, when God created man, He gave him dominion over the fowls of the air, over the fish of the sea, over everything. And then man fell in the garden and lost that dominion. But one day, that dominion will be restored. And the Bible tells us that we will reign forever and forever. In this city is the throne of God and the Lamb. We see that the Lord's church will then, as we said, this is the only time when we will see a universal church when all of the assemblies of the Lord's will be gathered together corporately together in heaven. While we're on this earth, we, we see the Bible talks about local, visible bodies. Every church that Paul wrote to was an individual church. There is no universal, invisible church on this earth. Amen. That's why we believe that the Lord has His kind of assembly and He's promised it perpetuity until He comes again. They shall see His face and they will enjoy His favor 
and they will worship him forever and forever. His name on their forehead, he openly acknowledges them as his very own, and they confess him as their Lord. They reign with him in this new universe. And all of these beautiful symbols apply in principle to the glorious blessings of perfection in that new and glorious universe. The inhabitants of the city, the citizens are the conquerors, the true Israel, the elect from every nation, including kings whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life, including those who were the lowest of low and those who all make that glorious and blessed place will be there because of grace. We have not earned it, and we do not deserve it. Right. You know, in, in our country, uh, we have a judicial system where when somebody commits a crime, they're supposed to be presumed, presumed innocent until proven guilty. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people want to condemn others. But you know, when, when the tide turns and it's the other person on the other side, suddenly they have a difference of opinion because the fact is we're all guilty. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you're not saved tonight, I want to offer you an invitation to come to Christ, to repent and receive Him into your heart by faith, and to be able to leave this place and say, I know that I'm saved. It's not my works that's going to get me there. It's not my baptism. It's not my church affiliation. It's because Christ has saved my soul. Let's stand together. I'll ask Brother Philip if he'll come, Kathy.